From destroying illegal oil labs in Colombia's dense jungle, to mining for rare gems in Afghanistan's rugged mountains, we traveled across the world to explore the 12 riskiest jobs that take patience and guts. Our first stop is Sri Lanka, where men crawl inside deep pits searching for sapphire and other valuable gems. Samaranaika Gay has lived his whole life in Ratnapura, which translates to the city of gems. His morning ritual includes preparing betel leaf and tobacco. Workers chew on this stimulant all day long for energy. The pit is 40 feet deep. The nearby river often seeps in, dumping sand, soil and water into the tunnels. Some underground mines are even deeper than the water table. So workers need to constantly run a pump to drain the pit. But the muddy water is often dumped on the surrounding land and could make it unfit for farming. This video was filmed during a particularly heavy rainy season. That's why the tunnels are even more flooded than usual. And that can cause them to collapse. In 2015, four people were killed in Ratnapura when a mine caved in. <laughs> to reinforce the pit, miners use logs from local rubber trees. They peel off the bark, which can trap moisture and make the wood rot easily. Then they gather a local fern called kekela. There are around 6,000 active mines in Sri Lanka. All are privately owned, but need licenses from the National Gem and Jewelry Authority. And it can take over a year to clear out all the gems from a single pit. Today, there are about 11 people crammed in here. The lack of oxygen makes it difficult to breathe, so they use air pumps to ventilate the tunnel through these tubes. Gases, like methane, are also naturally produced here. Years of experience have taught them to guess the direction of the deposits.
workers pack the gravel into sacks that can weigh up to 45 pounds. They rinse the gravel in a nearby stream to remove mud and sand. But the majority of the stones are worth nothing. On average, miners like Samara Naikage earn a basic salary of 1,200 rupees per week. That's about $3. And in Sri Lanka, it's enough to buy about a gallon of milk. But when they find a precious gem, they hand it over to the mine owners, who sell it to middlemen. Ratnapura is bursting with gemstones because of the area's geological foundation. Underground rocks here are subjected to high levels of heat and pressure that changes their chemical and physical composition, often creating gemstones. Heavy rains, landslides and rivers can move these deposits and carry them downstream. So miners also look for stones in the Kalu Ganga. They create a scaffolding and dive to the bottom to dig them up. Or they use blades attached to wooden poles called mammotes. That can cause extensive damage to riverbeds. It's why mines like these are more heavily regulated by the country's gem authority. But experts say underground pits are also harmful. Miners remove native vegetation when they clear out the land. And some pits aren't filled back in once mining is complete, causing accidents. The industry as a whole employs nearly 100,000 Sri Lankans. The stones are sold at wholesale markets like this one in Ratnapura. Chaminda Athuralia Gamage's workshop has been around since 2002. Workers cut the gems with a machine called a hana purua. Ita pas se many KP men ituru na me me many kudu. Evat ganna samaning visiduru atkam nirmana karanda. The smaller pieces are later shaped and polished into individual gems. A one carat blue sapphire from Sri Lanka can range from four hundred and fifty dollars to sixteen hundred dollars depending on the four C's, color, cut, clarity, and carat, or weight. The largest star sapphire in the world was found in Ratnapura in 2016. It's called the Star of Adam, and it's worth $300 million. While global demand is growing, the gems are still refined in a traditional way. At this workshop in Ratnapura, Sunil is using a centuries-old technique to enhance the color of the gems. He places them on coals as hot as 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Then he blows on the embers for several hours, which alters the color and clarity. Artisans say this method has been used for more than 1,500 years. But Sri Lanka's gem mining industry is much older. Jewels adorned thrones of Sri Lankan royalty from 540 BC. Kings from the island often sent gems to foreign lands to establish trade and relationships. Venetian explorer Marco Polo even mentioned the gems in his journals. But a political and economic crisis has put this historic gem industry at risk. 
Hundreds of thousands of Sri Lankans took part in widespread protests last year and ousted President Gotabaya Rajapaska. They blamed his government for high inflation as prices of food and fuel spiked. And that directly affected miners. Samara Naikage's wife, Pia Sili Ihalage, says their family had a hard time making ends meet. But no matter what the circumstances, Pia Sili says the work is always unpredictable. Sometimes miners can go weeks without finding a valuable gem. And although Samara Naika Gay has been doing this for decades, he wants a different path for his only child. These dusty tunnels in Afghanistan hide precious jewels worth millions. Miners carved these caves with dynamite left behind by decades of war. Habibullah is hunting for a green stone called berush or tourmaline. About $3 trillion worth of precious minerals are buried inside mountains across Afghanistan. Habib says the mines are not owned or regulated by anyone. For decades, insurgent groups and the Taliban mined and smuggled the jewels out of the country and used the profits to buy weapons. Even today, 95% of gems leave the country illegally. So how did rocks become more precious than human life here? And why are people in one of the most resource-rich countries in the world still struggling with poverty? The province of Kanar was one of the deadliest places in Afghanistan. Decades of fighting forced thousands of families to flee their homes. But Habib and his nine cousins grew up around here and know every inch of these mountains. Habib hikes for 10 hours to reach a campsite nearly 10,000 feet above sea level. They'll live here mining for the next month. <laughs> Habib first spotted tourmaline in these mountains 25 years ago. Now, with decades of experience, the 55-year-old is the leader of his group. And with that short prayer, the men are ready to crawl down 300 feet. Yeah, 
the veins are actually magma that cooled under high pressure, creating emerald and tourmaline. They're already 300 feet deep, and they can't go any farther without air. This narrow tube pumps their oxygen from a ventilator above ground. <coughs> <laughs> Inhaling all this dust can scar workers' lungs for life. But nothing stops these men. Today, they're going even deeper into the mine because they've gotten everything they can from these walls. <laughs> to get farther into the bedrock, they drill holes and fill them with dynamite. The bedrock that contains the gems is often brittle and could easily collapse with heavy drilling. In 2019, 30 miners were buried alive at a gold mine in another province. The dynamite is all set. Now they have less than a minute to get out of this tunnel. They usually go back in to retrieve the gems. But today they left early because they heard the Taliban was on its way. During the 20-year war, the Taliban and other insurgent groups operated most of these mines. Reports suggest they were earning up to $20 million a year smuggling jewels out of the country. And the gems continue to fund the Taliban today, after the group regained control of Afghanistan. Meanwhile, people like Habib struggle to find buyers, since most countries don't openly trade with Afghanistan. His only option is selling to local jewelers. He divides the money among his workers. Habib makes about $140 a month, nearly double the average salary in this country. But he has to feed his wife and 12 children. And it's hard to sell his gems for more. Uh, 
اگوی مثل کشورهای دیگه ور درست استخراج شو که درز نداشته باشه اون ما خدا قیمتش بالاست نور احمد شیرزاد has been polishing gems for more than 30 years He learned the craft from his cousin in Pakistan when his family lived there as refugees during the Afghan civil war. But he returned in the early 2000s and set up a workshop with his brothers here in Kabul. I He works mostly with blue lapis lazuli. باز از ده کیلو از این یک کیلو این تو نگین پاکشیدگی می‌برای. تو که کمک وارد فکر تگاسی شو نباشه فکر تگاسی بکار دانگوش تمیزه نی چیش ماوگار میشه متوبل چندین بار ما از آینا که استفاده نکنیم. Noor's younger brother Amir Ahmad Shirzad runs the store upstairs. His son helps out before school. They sell everything from dishes to jewelry and sculptures. Amir says he prices items based on the weight of the stones and how long each piece took to make. He even sells the type of stone Habib mines. And he makes these prayer bead necklaces himself. He says business has been tough lately. Back in Kanar, when Habib isn't busy mining, he's working on his new home just minutes away from the mines. He will no longer have to walk 10 hours to get to work. While he risks his life hunting for gems, it has helped him pay for this new home. And Habib is thankful for that. This man is hunting for an aphrodisiac that some people have called a natural Viagra. It only forms at high altitudes, like here in the Himalayas. One misstep and the drop is 15,000 feet. People across South Asia have taken Shilajit for centuries to improve libido and to treat infertility. Shilajit ki jo aaj tak major marketing hui hai, wo as a testosterone booster hui hai. Now, people are paying hundreds of dollars to get their hands on it. But while it's soaring in popularity around the world, so are the fakes. So is Shilajit really a miracle product? And is the risk of finding it worth the hype? The Valley of Padar is one of the most remote regions in Jammu and Kashmir. And Manohar Lal is the only one in his small village who dares to harvest Shilajit. Today, he's heading out with his son Lakshmi and their friend Aditya. The journey to the Pir Panjal range in the lower Himalayas will take them about two to three days. 
जब पहले गए थे डर तो बड़ा डेंजरस वाला रास्ता था डर तो लग ही जाता है जंगलों में तो भालो भी होता है रीच भी होता है तो थोड़ा देख के जाना पड़ता है They're going to climb up 12,000 feet. That's the height at which shilajit forms in the Himalayas. It's also found in Russia, Tibet, and even the north of Chile. After 10 hours of hiking, the men spot some deposits. But they're sitting on a steep rock wall, and the only way of getting there is climbing. <laughs> Now Manohar is on his own. He uses nothing but his own body for support. It's mind over matter walking on the edge at 12000 feet. Danger se aas aas se jana padta hai dekh ke jana padta hai agar kahin phisal gaye to mar bhi sakte hain gir jate hain. Finally he reaches the black shilajit rocks. It's hard like cement, so he needs a chisel to break it off. They're found in the cracks and crevices of mountains where rain and snow can't get in. ये समझो पत्थर की चर्बी. It forms when microorganisms decompose certain plants over centuries. What's left behind is shilaji. Manohar usually extracts it in spring and then again in fall before the snow can get to it. पुरख जो बोलते हैं कि गर्मी में सांप होते हैं शिलाजीत को ये चाटते हैं इसको काफी पसंद करते हैं इसलिए इसको गर्मी में नहीं जा, जाते हैं After collecting about 500 grams, they call it a day and set up a camp to stay overnight. Everybody is trying to be healthy and uh, eat good food. So, uski wajah se log chahte to hain unko shilajit mile. Shilajit has its roots in Ayurvedic medicine, which originated in India over 3,000 years ago. It's a traditional healing system that uses natural products. and ancient texts talk about its healing powers but shilajit can't be eaten in its raw form so manohar first cooks the rocks they dissolve in boiling water he filters out sand and other impurities hum iski filtration karte hain around kai baar do baar kai baar char ya panch baar bhi karni padti hai jab tak hamare ko dikhe ki koi bhi impurities jo hain wo usme nahi reh gayi hain Here in Kashmir, they have a unique recipe for it. पुराने शास्त्रों में भी लिखा है और पुराने traditionally जम्मू और कश्मीर में इसी तरह से शिलाजीत बनाते हैं कि उसमें थोड़ा सा गोमूत्र, थोड़ा सा देसी घी, थोड़ा सा गंगा जल और थोड़ा सा शहद डालते हैं. The remaining mixture gets sticky as it hardens, forming an edible shilajit paste. Research in shilajit is limited, but Ayurvedic experts say. that it is rich in metallic compounds minerals and nutrients and it's especially effective for treating infertility they did find that the sperm count increased they also saw an increase in testosterone levels as well as things like energy muscle growth not just in men but also in women it also contains folic acid which is said to boost immunity and reduce inflammation isko khane se 10 15 din ke baad And some studies show that shilajit could help treat cognitive disorders. With Alzheimer's, it's been shown to decrease the accumulation of the tau protein, and the tau protein is a protein that accumulates and creates plaques in the brain and leads to Alzheimer's. Like most dietary supplements, shilajit is not regulated by the FDA, and there are tons of fake products on the market. So Aditya Sumbria ensures that his products are the real thing by going along with Manohar on the hunt. 
स्केरसिटी है इसकी बहुत रेयर है बहुत डिफ़िकल्ट है इसको ढूंढना तो उसकी वजह से मतलब मैक्सिमम लोगों को ओरिजिनल चीज़ नहीं मिल पाती है द फेक्स यूजली कम इन पाउडर फॉर्म एंड मे बी अडल्टरेटेड विथ कोल एंड फर्टिलाइजर्स अदर्स कंटेन अ मिनरल वैक्स कॉल्ड अजोकराइट विच लुक्स लाइक शिलजीत बट हैज नो मेडिसिनल वैल्यू The most potent kind of shilajit is said to contain traces of gold, but it's very rare and expensive, selling for about sixty dollars for just two and a half teaspoons. The overall market for infertility supplements like shilajit is also booming. It's expected to reach three million dollars by 2030. Still, some places like Whole Foods have banned shilajit altogether. it's like from the earth the risk of it having the high, heavy metals or the mycotoxins may be greater than other herbs and perhaps there were some you know adverse effects when they weren't purified properly that's why experts say it's best to check the product's authenticity by asking for a certificate of analysis and usually this document is a simple document it's just what they've done to make sure that what you are purchasing is what it is in fact and the second piece of it is also just looking at what testing have they done manohar's wife fears for him every time he goes on these hikes udri bari mein dekhte hain thodi milti hai madad ho kheti baadi bas aur kya hai pet bharne ke liye Farming is impossible during the harsh winters. So the extra income from Shilajit really helps them get by. Pata nahi papa kaise chalte hain lekin ha itna pata hai papa risk mein ye wo utha lete hain kyunki hame school matlab fees ye wo sab kuch hai to un karna hi hota hai. Shilajit is part of the family's daily diet too. Manohar boils milk and adds it in. एक बार मेरा ये फ्रैक्चर हो गया था पाँव उस टाइम पर मैंने कोई सौ ग्राम खाया था नेक्सम मेरे ख्याल में कोई पचास परसेंट इससे फर्क हुआ था नहीं तो मुझे साठी के लोटी लाठी के सारे चलना पड़ता था फॉर हिम यूजिंग शिलजीत इज अ ट्रेडिशन दैट गोज बैक जनरेशन पहले मैंने अपने दादाजी से सुना था वो तकरीबन छोटा था मैं तो सटोरी लगा देते ऐसे ऐसे पहाड़ी में शिलाजीत होता है Now he's happy to say he's continuing that legacy. Scavenging for rusted scrap metal is one of the only ways widows in Jakarta can make money. The women search for iron and steel from used ships in one of the most polluted waters in the world. Datri is 63 years old. But she has been the main breadwinner for her three kids since her husband died. Kadangnya saya cuma luarin air mata aja ya susah. Iya. Kadang sampai saya kadang bingung. Kadang saya bingung ya. Everything she touches has poisonous layers of rust. Ini, ini, ini masih ada tuh. Nih, tuh. Ship recycling is a multi-billion dollar global industry. And massive yards across the world break down everything from cruise liners, cargo vessels and oil tankers to naval warships. But these women make only about $2 a day selling small pieces. So why are so many widows stuck scavenging like this? And what makes it such a risky business? Every morning, Datri leaves her 10-month-old granddaughter behind and goes to work. She has always had a job, even before she got married at 19. Ke Jakarta karena saya kan pengen ngikut suami nyari makan sendiri. But things have been tough since her husband passed away 13 years ago. 
widows often struggle to find jobs in Indonesia because many believe they can bring bad luck. But the owner of this shipbreaking company lets widows scavenge for free. The women are only allowed to collect small pieces like these. The larger chunks belong to the ship owners to sell or reuse. Most of the valuable pieces are underwater near the ships. Letri uses a magnetic stick to find the metal. Paling parah kalau lagi licin, banyak oli, lumpur, jalannya susah. Thirteen rivers empty into Jakarta Bay, carrying with them sewage, toxins, and all kinds of trash. The three's thick gloves and socks don't always protect her. Once she stepped on a nail that went right through her foot. Saya sampai lima bulan nggak sembuh. Welders are constantly sawing off hot pieces of metal, so she has to be careful. Datri <laughs> says even though the job is dangerous, she's still proud of making her own money. Karena cari makan. Biar makan, gimana caranya? Yang penting masih sehat, hidup. Around noon, the women escape the heat with a quick lunch break. There are about 10 million widows like them across Indonesia. And most live in extreme poverty. Some turn to sex work to survive. Others are forced to send their children to work to make ends meet. Amina wanted to avoid that, so she took this job at the scrapyard 37 years ago. Jadinya udahlah, saya lebih baik nyari karat. Ya anak-anak ibaratnya ditinggal pada sekolah. Today, at 61 years old, she has many health issues, including severe arthritis. Kaki ini nih, kadang-kadang bengkak. Kalau nggak di sini, bengkak di sini. Bengkaknya, jalan-jalan, bengkaknya. Pokoknya nggak bisa, nggak bisa nggak minum obat. And she's afraid she will run out of breath and drown because she has heart problems. Karena kalau kumat, udah dari sini masuk ke sini, nusuk ke belakang, panas perih, sakitnya kayak apa. On a really good day, she collects as much as 200 kilograms and sells it for almost $3. With that, she can buy about four cups of rice for dinner. Her salary isn't enough to pay for her treatments. But she's too sick to find another job. Berdiri, kalau gosok kan berdiri. Gak kuat kakinya. Kerja lain, kerja apa sih nak? Nyuci gosok saya nggak bisa. Nowadays her children work, but Amina still helps with all the bills. And she'd rather scavenge than go into debt. 
Enggak, saya enggak kapok. Sayang lah ibaratnya di rumah deh, bengang-bengong. The widows sell the rusted scraps to Narwin, a middleman. Kalau kualitas karat yang bagus ya dia bening, nggak kotor, nggak hitam. Kalau yang jelek ya hitam, kotor. This is one of two shipbreaking yards in Jakarta. It takes 20 workers at least a week to cut down an entire ship, depending on its size. Most ships have a lifespan of 25 to 30 years, after which they are retired. But they have hazardous materials inside. Things like asbestos and pipes, heavy metals and paints, biological hazards from sewage tanks, radioactive material from gauges, and the list goes on. Left unchecked, they can seep into the soil, beach, and water near shipbreaking yards and destroy local marine habitats. But there are also many usable parts of a ship, including metal bars and plates. Those are recycled and sometimes used to make new ships or heavy machinery. Experts say this is a greener alternative to producing new steel, which uses a lot of energy. And it also saves the planet from more metal mining. So while workers like Datri and Amina play a crucial role in building a more sustainable industry, the profits and the praise are not trickling down to them. Both widows live in this colony. It's one of the poorest areas in Jakarta. Most of their neighbors also break down ships at the scrapyard or fish along the coast. <laughs> Datri raised her three sons here mostly on her own. Her husband died when the youngest was just 11. And she never considered marrying again. Karena dulu suami saya galak. Saya pernah ditonjok, pernah di apa, pernah. Saya senang itu biar anak sendiri yang penting bisa makan. Turun mau makan nih, mau berangkat nih. Turun. Ini buburnya. Now her kids are all grown up. But she shares her home with one of her sons and helps support his wife and their baby. Ini mau berangkat jaman ya. Ini tangan bagus ya. Menurut saya sih Bu Datri harusnya nggak usah kerja. Tapi mau gimana lagi namanya ngebantu, ngebantu untuk kerja, menghidupin sehari-hari. Kasian aja, apa namanya udah tua, umur udah kayak gitu, terus harus banting tulang. Her other kids rely on her too. Kemarin aja punya cincin 3 gram ya. Anak saya tuh kontrakan daripada diusir orang saya kasihin, benar. Udah mendingan saya lebaran nggak pakai cincin daripada anak saya diusir orang. Itu boleh ngumpulin cincin. Datri says her faith in God has helped her through the tough times. Ya itu terserah yang kuasa yang ngatur saya masih sehat. Yang penting masih sehat hidup. Alhamdulillah, amin aja. Go. Oh, nice. Oh, damn. I thought he was gone. That's early. Catching wild Burmese pythons takes serious skills. Right there, right there. You see it? Only 100 people are licensed to capture these snakes in Florida, where the invasive pest has decimated local wildlife. It's not easy once you catch crawling up this levee with a python. It's still fighting. You feel it. They get tighter and tighter. And sometimes I've almost felt like it could just pop my kneecap. 
They aren't poisonous, but they have super strong bodies that they use to squeeze and kill their prey, which could be as large as an alligator. The only way to try to stop the invasive species from taking over is by catching them one by one. So who are the fearless python hunters making the most out of this risky business? Why is python removal so urgent for Florida? And how did they get here in the first place? Hey, let go, let go, let go her tail. Wrap the rope around her. Wrap the rope. Here. Amy Seawe has caught over 400 pythons since she began hunting in 2019. When you see that python, it's adrenaline through the roof. Do it here. Somebody grab the tail and I can grab the head. You gotta pull this tight. Hurry up. Okay. Gotta pull it tight. Got it, got it, got it. Where is she? Where is she? You got, got the it. rope around it? I got a rope around Yeah, it's not tight. Sometimes it's an easy grab, sometimes it's a battle. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Here, bring that up on this camera here. Hell yeah. You, know, you just never know what you're going to get, so it keeps it very exciting. She taught herself how to skin the animals and often does it at home. She uses pool salt to preserve it until she can send it to a tannery. We have to put it on thick enough so it'll uh, get in all of the little crevices. And that is a snake roll. In 2019, she developed her own line of python leather, turning the skin into bracelets and wristbands. I hate that we have to kill them. That is the worst part of this job. But we do, there's no other choice. So I've kind of made it my mission to figure out how to use as much of the python as possible so they don't go to waste. Back in the 1980s, these snakes were sold as exotic pets. They were imported from Southeast Asia, and newspaper ads priced them at a few hundred dollars. Then, in 1992, dozens of Burmese pythons escaped a breeding facility when Hurricane Andrew hit. And their spread has been nearly impossible to control, because they have no real predators here in the Florida Everglades, one of the largest wetlands on the planet. The biggest one ever found in Florida was 215 pounds, 18 feet long, and was ready to lay 122 eggs. The snakes swallow their prey whole. And while they rarely attack humans, they are killing all kinds of native animals, from small birds to large alligators. In 2012, populations of foxes and marsh and cottontail rabbits effectively disappeared because of pythons. We are finding those animals in their stomachs, including some endangered species and federally threatened species, such as the endangered Key Largo wood rat and the federally threatened wood stork. Now, licensed contractors like Peggy and Beth remove about 5,000 pythons a year from the Everglades. They start hunting after sunset because that's when snakes are out searching for prey. Good evening, this is Beth Kohler calling. I'm beginning a python survey in Francis S. Taylor. Only licensed python hunters and government officials are allowed to drive through these restricted levees. There's virtually no cell service once they enter. So they use a satellite radio. And if a serious injury were to happen, they would need to be airlifted out. Spotting a python is hard, even with that flashlight. I'll see a python and it's moving, and we'll get in that area, and you're looking around, and you might as well step on it before you see it. I mean, it's amazing how well they can camouflage themselves into this. Still, they say this is easy compared to their full-time job grooming dogs. We've been in business together for 35 years now, and um, it's a lot of work. That job is hard work. It, it makes this look like a cakewalk. <laughs> but it takes patience. Often they can hunt all night and still leave empty-handed. It's like regular life, hours and hours of boredom and then minutes of pure adrenaline. <laughs> Let's go get some pythons. I'm looking for like an 
opalescent sheen, like a water bottle or a piece of glass. The, the light will catch the, the, the shine of the, the python. They're scanning the environment for other dangers. You know, there might be an alligator in the water nearby. There might be a cottonmouth nearby. We followed them on three hunts before they finally spotted a python. Right there, right there. You see it? Yeah. Then it's all hands on deck. Got it. Got it. They keep the snakes on the ground. Lifting it in the air would scare it. It's a battle, you've got to wear it out, you know, and get it calmed down so you can get it in the bag. So you're sweating, it's very hot. Even the smallest python, you will be shocked at the strength. They're nothing but muscle. Keep going, keep it tight. Florida's Fish and Wildlife Agency pays hunters by the hour and by how long a snake is. All right, almost nine footer. Is it fifty dollars for the first four feet, and then an additional twenty-five dollars for each foot beyond four feet? So, like a five-foot snake is seventy-five dollars. But they don't kill the snakes in the wild. The state decides whether they'll euthanize the animal later or if it'll be used for research. They double bag it and put it inside a lockbox. All right, lock, lock her up. I grew up down here, so I definitely can see the, the, the impact these pythons have had on the environment. Peggy and Beth started hunting five years ago after they participated in the Florida Python Challenge in 2016. That's a 10-day event that anyone can enter and get a cash prize for catching a snake. Animal rights groups like PETA have criticized it because they say it allows inexperienced people to go barging about in forests and swamps on a macho mission to kill. But the FWC does require participants to take an online course before the hunt. She's backing up trying to figure out, can I get away from her? And biologists like Michaela Spencer say, euthanizing the snakes is the only way to control the problem. We always have people asking, have you thought about rehoming them? Could we send them back to their native country? Well, you know, remember these animals are established in a whole different ecosystem. They could have different diseases and things like that. So we really can't ship them anywhere else. Her not striking is a good sign that she's tiring out. Oh, we got her. She works for the FWC and showed us how hunters can capture the snakes safely. The second I had her pinned right behind that head, I reached in and grabbed. If she goes around my leg, it can be a good example of like why I give her a leg and not my arms. She's actually staying relatively calm after capturing her, probably because that back and forth tired her out. <laughs> but I've got my leg here. I'm not sitting on her, just to be clear. I don't put any weight on a snake, and I tell people don't ever sit on them, don't put any weight. Sometimes they'll just put themselves in the bag once you start to feed them in there. There we go. And then a little bit more of a quail. All right, we'll just feed her in there. So she goes in here and stick that top on. Since the snakes need to be eradicated, some python hunters are doing what they can to preserve the legacy. They're amazing creatures. They're beautiful. It's not their fault they're here. They're just doing what pythons do. Amy says her leather line is her own way of honoring the reptiles. This is a skin that has some battle wounds on it, some scars on it from the python being in the wild. You know, it they get bitten by alligators. They get clawed by bears. They get in fights with themselves, with each other. The cool thing about this is that if, if you get a product that is made out of, with this scar in it, it is the only one like it in the world, and this is from the Everglades. You know that you're helping the Everglades when you are taking these animals out. Well, I just try to remind myself that for the greater good, a lot of natives are gonna live. I can remove one python and give dozens of rabbits a chance at a good life. Hundreds of illegal oil refining labs 
are fueling the cocaine trade in Colombia. And a special police force is hunting them down and destroying them one by one. The labs are run by locals who steal crude oil from a nearby pipeline and turn it into gasoline. Pues principalmente los grupos armados al margen de la ley. Es el principal riesgo. Uno tiene que estar muy atento en cada uno de los movimientos que desarrolla. That low quality fuel is one of the main ingredients in another illegal product, cocaine. O sea, que coca ahorita hay en todas partes. En Nariño, en Putumayo, que está en Cauca, en todas partes hay coca. Colombia is the top cocaine producer in the world. Even though it has waged a war on drugs since the 1970s, before the time of Pablo Escobar. Now, the government is cracking down on every part of the cocaine production cycle, including the illegal oil refineries. So why do locals risk their lives working in these illegal industries? And what dangers do Colombian police face when they raid the labs? Jorge Moreno's team of nearly 40 officers has flown in from Cali for today's mission. Me gusta lo que hago. Siempre doy más de lo que en ocasiones me corresponde. Y me gusta estar con los muchachos. Nearly 200 soldiers from the Colombian Armed Forces are also joining them. They gather at the Llorente police station near the coastal city of Tomaco. They're arming up in case they encounter criminal gangs and drug cartels. Son las ametralladoras, armas pesadas, armas livianas, una de calibre 5.56, otra de 7.62 y MGL, que ya son granadas explosivas, lanzan granadas explosivas. At the crack of dawn, they head into the jungle. Along the way, they stop by the Transandino oil pipeline. Most of it is above the ground, making it easier to drill holes and steal the crude. Ustedes se dan cuenta que todas esas camisas, todos esos eh, soldaduras y demás han sido instalación de válvulas ilícitas. The Colombian government is the majority shareholder of Ecopetrol, the company that runs the pipeline, which carries crude from the Orito oil field to Tumaco. From there, the majority of it is exported to the U.S. But recently, the country has lost more than 270,000 barrels annually to theft. That amounts to over $2 billion. Today, they didn't find any holes, at least in this stretch. But illegal oil refineries are usually not too far from the pipeline. So the team moves into the jungle. Months of research and planning have prepared them for this trek. They also know this region well. And they use an app from the National Police. It tells them where there are drops in pressure on the pipeline, which usually means it's been tapped. These hoses are a sign they're on the right track. The thieves attach the tubes to valves and suck the crude oil from the pipeline into these pools in the middle of the jungle. Abajo a la orilla del río. Ahí se alcanza a ver desde donde estaba la línea del oleoducto que hicimos la primera toma y siguen extendiéndola. Pueden extenderla hasta kilómetros. 
After walking for more than two hours, they finally reach the refinery. But it's already been abandoned. Moreno says workers were probably tipped off by locals in the area. But they hadn't been gone for long. Eso significa que está trabajando ahorita. A pool of refined gasoline was still there. Locals call it pategrio, which means cricket's foot. Workers often dump unused crude on the ground, contaminating the land and surrounding rivers. Trees and leaves here are dripping with sludge. Esto es algo artesanal que pues a ellos poco o nada les importa porque les está dejando una buena lucración para ellos. The refineries also release toxic gases into the air that are powerful enough to kill animals on the forest floor. Just one of these labs can contaminate three square miles of land. El daño ambiental es la tala de los bosques, la contaminación de los suelos, la pérdida de la capa vegetal, la contaminación de las fuentes hídricas que ustedes mismos se dan cuenta ya el río Huiza. Moreno says that bringing in helicopters to remove the oil isn't a practical option in this dense jungle. So the only way to destroy this refinery and the remaining patigrio is to blow it up. but the fuel can burn for hours, causing even more pollution. Entonces le toca a uno inhabilitarlos, causándole el menor daño ambiental. Entonces utilizamos ese tipo de explosivos para inhabilitarlos, pero siempre tratando de causar el mínimo daño posible. Last year, Moreno and his team destroyed 60 labs in a single mission. But hundreds still sprawl across the jungle. Travel worked at an illegal refinery in Tumaco for four months. La casa pues era pues para ayudar a mi familia, pues para darles un mejor futuro, pensaba yo, pero pues vea. No sé yo. One day, the facility caught fire. The flames burned his face and hands. Entonces la candela allá se vino por el tubo y impactó acá donde estaba recibiendo la, la gasolina, entonces la, la explosión. He was in a coma for two months and needed a face transplant. Now he wears a mask to cover his scars. He lives alone. He says his wife left him because he couldn't make a living. Como no, ya está arrepentido. Son cosas pues que pasan, no se arrepiente, pero pues como dice el dicho, ya es tarde. Workers like Travel don't have any safety protocols in these labs. They heat the crude in a 300-gallon tank by lighting a fire underneath. Most of the oil vaporizes into gas, which cools and condenses back into liquid in these pipes. That's the low-quality gasoline, or pate grillo. There's a lot of demand for it because it's cheaper than regular petrol. Travel earned nearly $800 a month selling it. That's four times the country's minimum wage. His customers were mostly coca farmers, who often use the pate grillo to make a paste, which is the base for cocaine. Carlos started growing coca 15 years ago because it's more lucrative than other crops. But farming it is illegal in Colombia, so we are hiding his identity. The leaves are not ready for harvest yet, but Carlos showed us how he typically go about making coca paste. In this part here is where the cosechero comes from, and this is where it weighs los kilos, las arrobas que traiga, lo que coge al diario. An arroba is a measurement for coca leaves. One arroba is about 25 pounds. Y esta es una una picadora que se utiliza para para picar la hoja para que quede más pulverizada para 
y con las cuchillas da vuelta y corta y sale por allá. After the coca leaves are pulverized, he uses gasoline or papadrillo to soak them. He also adds water and an alkaline substance like baking soda. This mixture extracts compounds from the plant that make cocaine addictive. Este es un acelerante que para de la producción de coca para que pele más rápido la Sí, estos, estos productos son fáciles de conseguir. Estos es en cualquier agrícola aquí en, en aquí en el pueblo. Carlos most often sells his coca paste to cartels or drug smugglers. Bueno, un campesino cocalero vive como cualquier otro campesino. Lo único que queremos es que no nos estigmaticen de de narcotraficantes y lo único que queremos es trabajar y vivir en paz. His wife says they tried growing other crops. Aquí un tiempo hubo que sembraron yuca, pero eso digamos cuando la gente sembró harta estaba baratísima, entonces la gente la hizo perder porque no daba resultado. También digamos plátano, el chiro, el banano, no hay quien lo quien lo compre. More than 200,000 families across Colombia live off of coca farming. Un racimo de plátano te dan 10,000 pesos. En cambio, si sembramos coca, nomás llevamos un peso de 2 kilos y tenemos 5 millones de pesos. Francisco has been farming coca for 23 years. He lives in Nariño, a remote part of the country where there are hardly any other well-paying jobs. Si uno tiene hambre, tiene que salir a buscar dónde encuentre trabajo, encuentre qué comer, porque nadie se va a dejar morir del hambre. Eso pasó. Entonces ahorita estamos otra vez en lo mismo. Hay mucha gente que no quería hacerlo, pero de ver la necesidad le tocó hacerlo. The government introduced a crop substitution program in 2016. And a UN report shows that about 100,000 families signed up, but most of them didn't receive the full promised payments. Cuando se dio el proyecto de sustitución, crea lo que arrancó bastante coca. Ellos mismos, voluntario, se hizo y no quiero quedó quedó muy poquita. Pero con el abandono que el gobierno se desperdió y nunca cumplió, entonces la gente a raíz de eso volvió otra vez a sembrar. Porque nadie se va a dejar morir el hambre. Insider reached out to the agency in charge of the program, but has not heard back. Unlike other crops, like coffee or plantains, coca can be harvested up to six times a year. The plant now covers five times more land than it did in the days of Pablo Escobar. Most Colombian cocaine ends up in the United States, where more than 20,000 people died of cocaine-related overdoses in 2021. Colombia has also seen its share of death from cartel violence, especially here in Nariño. Ya, ya empezó la coca con en los 90 y ya llegó, se fue progresando más en el 2000. Con la coca llegó la violencia, llegaron los muertos, llegó todo. Y aquí se ha enterrado mucha gente. Se ha matado mucha gente. Hubo este día, habían días que nos tocaban enterrar 3, 4, 5. Por lo menos legalizado sería una, una buena idea, pero si se legaliza, esto no va a tener comercio, porque esto ya le ponen un precio. Si se legaliza, esto queda por el suelo. The country's new leftist president, Gustavo Petro, wants to legalize cocaine. But the U.S., Colombia's main partner in the war against drugs, does not support that move. For years, it has been the largest funder of counter-narcotic operations in the Latin American country. Together, they destroyed more than 5,700 drug labs and seized a record amount of cocaine in 2021. And the country is also going after the illegal refineries. But Moreno says bringing them down is challenging. Todos los controles los hace, pero no, pues las 24 horas del día no puede dejar un personal ahí. Entonces ellos aprovechan inclusive en horas nocturnas. Destroying the distilleries isn't enough either, because they're so easy to set up in the first place. Moreno says that when they take one down, workers quickly put up another one in the jungle. And he admits 
that burning down the labs is hurting the fragile ecosystem. Pero pues, ¿qué hace uno? Tratar de causar el mínimo daño de lo que ya prácticamente uno ha encontrado. No nos digamos mentiras, todavía la selva amazónica y en donde nos encontramos no es virgen, pero el daño que le estamos ocasionando, lo que le están ocasionando esta gente es bastante considerable. Unos daños medioambientales que duran en recuperarse cientos de años. These rustic oil refineries in Syria are a ticking time bomb. The slightest mistake and they can blow up, killing workers. Thousands of these facilities popped up in northern Syria after civil war broke out in 2011. Now, Millions of displaced people rely on them for fuel to run their cars, businesses, and homes. Including Ahmed Abdullah, who owns some of the refineries. So, what does it take to filter crude oil at these informal refineries in Syria, where children do a lot of the dirty work? And why is this black gold a blessing and a curse for the people here? Ahmed and his family live in a small village called Tarheen near the city of Albad. It's controlled by opposition forces. And it became a safe haven for many refugees during the war. About 400,000 displaced people live here today. Satellite images of Tarheen from 2011 show orchards. Several years later, the land is black and barren and marked by refineries. Ahmed owns three of the roughly 650 facilities in this part of town. And he and his siblings poured their life savings into the business when they started in 2012. <laughs> The crude oil is refined in these 55-gallon metal drums or burners. Each of these can cost up to $50,000. A coal-powered furnace heats the burners. The crude oil evaporates and flows into pipes. These are submerged in water basins so that the vapors can condense and turn into diesel, kerosene, or gasoline. The heaviest part of the oil settles at the bottom of the drums. It's highly flammable and needs to be removed before the drum is used again for refining. This is what Ahmed calls briquette, and it's used for cooking and heating. Sometimes it's teenagers who climb into the drums to clean them because they can squeeze through. Ahmed doesn't want them around these dangerous tanks. But he says many war-torn families have no other choice. Even his own 16-year-old son helps clean the drums.
After a long morning, Ahmed takes a break with his workers. Today, he's having tea with Mahmoud Abu Ibrahim, who nearly died in 2018 when an oil drum exploded. His eyes were permanently damaged. Just like Ahmed, Mahmoud is also a refugee. Before the war, he was an electrical engineer. He is exposed to plumes of smoke that release toxic chemicals, slowly poisoning workers. The smoke also coats plants and trees killing them off. And oil spills have contaminated the ground and drinking water. These makeshift refineries started showing up between 2011 and 2012, when Syrians led a revolution against President Bashar al-Assad. At the time, Ahmed was a paralegal in his hometown of Al-Safira which had become a battleground. So in 2012, he fled with his family and eventually settled in Tarheen. But the worst was yet to come. In 2014, ISIS rose to power and eventually took over the country's official infrastructure, says Wim Zweinenberg, a researcher who's been following the Syria war. And ISIS uh, made a lot of money from selling his oil to the smugglers. So in order to prevent that, the US-led coalition uh, started bombing um, some of these locations to target wellheads, uh, pumping stations, in order to prevent ISIS from pumping up the oil. The Syrian Democratic Forces and coalition troops defeated ISIS in 2019. But over the last 12 years, the war has claimed over 300,000 civilian lives. Today, Syria is informally divided into several regions. Assad's forces hold most of it. The Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces have the oil-rich Northeast. And Syrian opposition forces backed by Turkey control other parts of the north, including Al-Bab. So tankers regularly deliver tens of thousands of gallons of crude from the Kurd-controlled areas to Al-Bab, where locals distill it. Thousands of people here work in the industry. So taking away a livelihood and income for, for families in this area uh, from this industry wouldn't be beneficial for any post-conflict uh, um, reconstruction or re rehabilitation efforts. Ahmed's home, just a mile away, runs on the same fuel. These generators that pump out well water use diesel. The fuel and the azot and benzene but the very thing that fuels life for Ahmed and so many others is destructive in more ways than one. And that's where the white helmets come in. They're a humanitarian group of first responders from all over Syria. Hassan Mohammed is one of about 3,000 volunteers. They were especially active at the height of the war in 2014. 
كان يكون في شهداء يكون في اصابات ناس عاقين تحت الانقاض They've rushed to the site of at least 550 oil refinery explosions. Hassan says sometimes they're a result of recklessness in the refining process. But other times, the Syrian government has targeted these refineries. أضرار مادية كبيرة جدا في الحراقات في محطات تكرير الوقود كان هدفنا الوحيد هو أن نحن نقلل من الخسائر البشرية الخوف الأكبر هو القصف الطيران يعني هذا عم يجينا مفاجئ ومشكل ضرر وما ضرر على حراقة واحدة وطاقم واحد أو شخص واحد Despite the risks, this is a lucrative business in an area with few other opportunities يعني نحن كان في عنا عمل برا ولكن نحن ناجحين وجينا أسسنا عمل وأسسنا بيوت وأسسنا كذا وما عنا غير حراقات وفي عنا كان عمل يشتغل باقي له مادتين بتخرج طب موضوع لأن أنا بعد ما أتخرج أروح أشتغل بمشفى يعطوني راتب ألفين أنا الحراقة أحسن All together, his three refineries produce nearly a thousand barrels of fuel a day. نحن حاليا هون بالشمال ما عندنا مجال للتخزين نهائيا لان المنطقه دائما بحاجه معجون، السيارات الناس المدنيه تاخذه للكازيات ويصير مبيعه للمستهلك. Ahmed buys the crude for $70 a barrel and sells the refined fuel for $100. He makes enough to comfortably support his family. But even staples like groceries are expensive in the war-torn country. And about 60% of the population is battling food insecurity. In his downtime, Ahmed and his sons tend to his Arabian horses. He owns 12 of them. His favorite one is called Shahab, which means shooting star. He frequently participates in horse racing competitions. The hobby is a remnant of his old life that he hopes to go back to one day. <laughs> بيكفيك كلمة مهجر، بيكفيك كلمة ناجح، أتمنى يعني نرجع لبيوتنا. أرجع على بلدي. بتمنى أتحرر بلدي. والجراثيم الطارئة على المجتمع هاي بترجع كمان لحالها هي بتروح. Cooking limestone is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. These handmade kilns burn for 24 hours straight. And workers like Parvez Sheikh have to feed the fire constantly, breathing toxic fumes and risking severe burns. <laughs> Many workers can't afford an education and are stuck in these jobs for life. Gulshir Ali and his seven sons mine limestone from these cliffs every day, setting up dynamite explosions without any protective equipment or supervision. Limestone is a crucial ingredient in all kinds of products, from paint to cement and even sugar. So why is it so hard to break out of this generational trade? And what makes handling limestone such a risky business? This part of Sindh province looks barren, even though it's rich in minerals. But cutting massive rocks of limestone from these cliffs without machinery takes hours. So workers set up explosives. It takes about an hour to dig three feet deep holes. 
ਉਹ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਉਹਦਾ ਸੋਰਾ ਕੋ ਪੋ ਜੇ ਕੇ ਵਧੀ ਵਰਸ਼ ਗੁਲਸ਼ੇਰ ਅਲੀ ਵਾਸ ਜਸਟ 12 ਵੈਨ ਹੀ ਫਰਸਟ ਲਰਨ ਥਿਸ ਜੌਬ ਫਰਮ ਹਿਸ ਫਾਦਰ ਹੀ ਹੈਸ ਟਾਟ ਆਲ ਆਫ ਹਿਸ ਸੈਵਨ ਸੰਸ ਦੇ ਆਰ ਨਾਟ ਟ੍ਰੇਨ ਟੂ ਹੈਂਡਲ ਗਨ ਪਾਊਡਰ ਐਂਡ ਐਨੀਥਿੰਗ ਕੈਨ ਗੋ ਰੋਂਗ ਗਾਂ ਪਰੇ ਜੇ ਨਾ ਕੇ ਬਾਹਰ ਤੀਲੀ ਨਾ ਲਗੇਗਾ ਜੀ ਚਣ ਕਾ ਲਗੀ ਹੋਈ ਨਹੀਂ ਤਾਂ ਪਾਰਟੀ ਪਾਉਂਦੋ ਗੁਲਸ਼ੇਰ ਐਡਸ ਅ ਲੇਅਰ ਆਫ ਫਰਟੀਲਾਈਜ਼ਰਸ ਐਂਡ ਕਵਰਸ ਦਾ ਹੋਲ ਵਿਦ ਸਟੋਨਸ Lighting the dynamite is the most dangerous part. They only have a couple of minutes to walk away. Ha, in that case I you understand the quarter ma jo khayal sa kayo, unda jo time a inda 3 baje raat jo. There isn't any official data in Pakistan on the number of deaths, injuries and illnesses in the industry. But Gulshay remembers how he was injured 9 years ago. Pero sanjo yo zakhmi theo niye to na mathe paad to sanjo kholi to la pyo to pathar keri pyo ye angur bhi kapi di gayi to ye ta je same to ye angur hit ch bhi dagi pe to ye to sanji kapi di gayi. Kharab the paisa na ha vadikat khau ja jang tha rahe ho. when they began cut up the still he spends 6 hours a day moving and breaking rocks that weigh as much as 100 pounds zahiri aane insaan chahe patthar jo varzan ketro a to khano mushkil a lado kat toni kar to ha kaja la kaja la the pakistani government owns this land and allows people to mine there for $32 a year. Gulshir says his ancestors used to have a permit, but he's never applied for one himself, and he says no one bothers him. They wrap up work by 10 a.m. and get together for a quick cup of tea. Gulshir's sons dropped out of school in the 8th grade and also work here full time. Me phuz kar gadi ka aaye ko na ta sham mein me phuz gaya. Today they've collected enough to fill a truck. They're selling the load to a nearby kiln for 2500 rupees or just $8. And after splitting it, each person will be left with just $2 a day. These men at the kiln break the rocks into even smaller pieces and stack them around the furnace. It can take 3 days to build a single kiln which can process up to 1000 tons of limestone every week. This kind of kiln dates back to the Roman Empire and was brought to this region by the British. Most European countries have ditched them for modern machinery. The final structure can be as high as 33 feet. They leave a narrow opening at the very top for the smoke to escape. Then workers start building a fire by loading up dried palm fronds from date trees nearby. Parvez Sheikh has been doing this work for more than half his life. Nande hunde mazo hindu hane bazaar thi am. He keeps feeding the fire until the kiln gets as hot as 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Mes bay bogus chona bas mal ka khira da to paante mala ghar pahunchaya da. Sizzling hot stones once fell on Parvez from the stack dome. Painda de de buto buto painda de ni randa khonda pair pat ji pounda ne. Garamani buto bhi The limestone has to bake for at least 24 hours. Five workers take 20-minute shifts watching the blaze and adding more leaves. Parvez and his brother have worked here since they were teenagers. Har chai khatro aa gayi. Nuksaan aa par garibata hai jeje kar kaya hunda. Sai akhan jo nuksaan aa ali ali 5 saal 8 saal 10 saal an ka akhan ji roshni khatam thi jandi aa ba jo kam aa Parvez has years of experience but he earns only $9 a week also much lower than Sin's minimum wage 
And sometimes he has to take out loans from the kiln owner to run his household. Zari galana. Badi ka khapandi da sa ke faydwa. Zaroor zarat ho diya tha, but set ke chana ba hazar badi sa ke. Vari panja kate jaye, varo di do acharo. These furnaces and a few others nearby are privately owned, and Parvez's cousin Papu Sheikh manages them. But he says there's not much he can do to help the workers. No coffee, no gatta. Shaaje kare, ta na me taklif aghniya, ina ne mojira ta gatta. Agar jhenne ji rakam ha, malikan ji hode badh ka hoje na, ta mazdoor ji gharn badh ka thi me. That's why it's hard to find new workers. मुश्किल है एक के दरते में तो मिला था कना वाह आलो मजूरी दे वो किन के ही ना न के जाब ही ना ने परवेज वर्क्स टायरलेसली बिकॉज़ ही कैन्ट अफोर्ड टू टेक एनी टाइम ऑफ असे माल को तावन कान कन वाह ये कले को किसी में दिखाएं तो ठीक है थोरो घनों खर्चे दिने तो ठीक है न तो वरी घनों न कन वाह � and the limestone is left to cool for 24 hours. Then all nine workers help break down the kiln. The cooked limestone is powdery and Parvez gets coated in dust. But workers can't just wash it off because quicklime produces heat when it's mixed with water and that can burn him. <laughs> Pakistan exported more than half a million dollars worth of limestone in 2021. The kiln we filmed at sends it to Bangladesh, China and Sri Lanka. Here in Pakistan, it's commonly mixed with water to create paint. <laughs> Limestone is crucial for construction because it's so versatile. It's soft enough to be shaped into bricks, but still durable. Roads and highways are often paved with it. And it's the building blocks of iconic landmarks like the Great Pyramid of Giza and the Parthenon. These days, it's a key ingredient in cement, which is made by heating limestone and mixing it with clay or shale. But the production of cement and concrete is responsible for 9% of the world's CO2 emissions every year. And kilns like these are also major pollutants, releasing poisonous gases like sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide. Experts say that's speeding up global warming and southern Pakistan is getting hit. Here in Rori, temperatures regularly reach 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's so unbearably hot that thousands of residents have moved away from the region. Harvests have also become unpredictable in a region that's known for farming. That's why many locals, like Parvez, have turned to mining. He stops by a goat farm on his way home to pick up milk for his four-year-old daughter. She was born 15 years after he got married. And he wants a better life for her and for his family. <laughs> But there aren't many other jobs in this village. So Parvez keeps toiling away at the kiln. Thousands of miners squeeze through tunnels every day to search for a mineral called mica. This kind is mostly used in electronics, cars, planes, even paint. 
and Madagascar is the largest exporter of sheet mica in the world. But miners like Razana Tsara Oreli have to risk their lives to dig it out. <coughs> These walls could collapse and kill her within seconds. <laughs> Workers also breathe in mica particles that can destroy their lungs. But in a country plagued by a severe drought, many families that used to farm have now turned to mica mining. And children work here too, often making just a few cents a day. This mineral is essential to making products that are worth thousands of dollars. So why do these families make so little? And is anything being done to help them? Razanat Sara lives in Antrivi, a small village about 10 miles away from the mica mine. She started mining after her husband died two years ago to support her family. Her sister Zoe is just 14 years old. And she's been crawling through these tunnels since she was 12. Some tunnels can be 500 feet deep, the height of a 50-story building. In here, mica shines through the dirt everywhere. Miners started extracting it in this region in the 1970s. Stabbing at these walls with a chisel can destabilize them and trigger landslides. And temperatures inside can reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They also showed us their cuts and bruises from mining. Today, they collected around 130 pounds of mica. They make about $3 from selling this load. And even that money has to be shared. Many families here had never worked in the mines before. They were mostly farmers, growing rice, corn, or cassava. But in the last few years, a crippling drought has hurt the agricultural industry. At least 1.6 million are now food insecure and need humanitarian assistance. It rains so rarely here that people rush to collect water, like Rafara Malala Yantra So's family. They used to grow crops in the town of Meneloha. This land where she mines officially belongs to the government, but no one stops locals from digging. There's little oxygen inside. And hammering stirs up clouds of fine mica dust. The toxic particles can cause a deadly lung disease called silicosis. 
Ilaina mins fandratsy sy dia tsy maintsy miaina mizava misy amin'ny mpoka peaks ny amin'ny tanana tahorana maratra amin'ny vato dia ilaina daholo izany Mama now even though the Ministry of Mines and Strategic Resources oversees the industry pits often operate without permits and miners say they have little support Bola tsy namme fanapina neta timtsiavo mifanjakana we reached out to the country's mining ministry for comment, but did not hear back. <laughs> After a long day of work, Rafara Malala says her whole body hurts. <laughs> but just like Razanat Sara, she barely makes enough to get by. Miners mostly sell the raw mica to middlemen. Some of them have no idea what it's used for. They sell the mica to companies that process it overseas. 87% of it goes from Madagascar to China. This specific type is prized for being a great insulator. That's why it's used in electrical cables, car batteries, planes, trains, and smartphones. One study shows that 15,000 different car parts could contain the mineral. And Madagascar made about $11 million in 2021 from mica exports. But the wealth doesn't trickle down to the miners. Rafara Malala's three children, all under the age of 16, work here too. And you want to Los Angeles. They help her sort and sieve the mica once it's collected. Child labor in Madagascar is well documented, but it's dismissed as a result of extreme poverty. Often, families have to bring their young kids to the mines because they can't leave them alone at home. At least 11,000 children work in the country's mining sector. But experts say that number is probably much greater after four years of drought. We saw dozens toiling away at the mines we visited in the Ambo Wombe village, like 10-year-old Rasoa, who had to drop out of school after second grade. <laughs> Child labor is not just a problem in Madagascar. Mica mines in India, another major exporter, are also filled with children. The mica found here is used in cosmetics for its shimmering effect. And at least 22,000 kids dig for it in India's Jharkhand and Bihar districts. Despite the risks, families can't afford to stop working there. So nonprofits like the Responsible MICA Initiative are trying to empower them by providing education and access to better health care. It is also hoping to create a responsible international supply chain by trying to eliminate child labor at these mines. But that can be tricky. Many tech and auto companies buy parts containing MICA from Chinese firms that source it from different mines. So it's hard to tell whether it's ethical. Still, global demand for it is expected to grow 8% by 2030. Back in Antrobi, Razanat, Sara and Zo are heading home after an eight-hour day in the pits. <laughs> She has two young daughters, so she needs this job, especially during the drought. 
But she hopes to go back to a life of farming one day. Seventy-year-old Basanti Meghwar spends her days making bricks to pay off a debt. So does her son Punjo, his wife, and their son Dilip. It's the only life the twelve-year-old has ever known. The family borrowed money from the owner of the brick kiln more than two decades ago to pay a hospital bill. Now, they spend long days breathing in dust under the scorching desert sun and firing bricks in massive underground kilns. <laughs> And they don't know if they'll ever get out of here. The owner of the kiln tells them he's keeping half of the money they earn to make payments on their loan. But Punjo hasn't seen the contract since he signed with his thumbprint 23 years ago. And there's no record of how much is left to pay. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're gonna. And now the Koji gone for joy. The Meghwars are among the millions of people in Pakistan who spend their lives making bricks to pay off debts to wealthy landowners. These bricks will be used in construction projects across Pakistan. But families take home so little, they often have to keep borrowing more just to get by. Lawyers say these bricks are part of a system of modern-day slavery. So how are so many families stuck in this endless cycle of debt? And why are they being overlooked? This brick kiln is in the heart of the Thar Desert in Pakistan. Temperatures here can reach up to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> 150 families work and live here. Most people are at the very bottom of the Hindu caste system. They're called Dalit, and they often work the least desirable jobs. The Meghwar's family of five shares just a one-room house and this tent. Dilip started working in the clay fields when he was just seven. Every day they hand over their quota of 1,500 bricks. They get paid $1.50 and are told that another $1.50 goes toward their loan payments. But they have to keep borrowing more just to get by. And they don't know how much interest is being added. The family thinks they still owe about $560. Meanwhile, the owner of the kiln could bring in that same amount in about a week just by selling the bricks the Meghwars make. Insider reached out to the owner. He refused to comment on how the quota and debt scheme works. Still, the family does not blame him. To make the clay for these bricks, workers first need to dig up dirt. <laughs> Then Dilip adds water and mixes the mud for hours until it turns into clay. Yeah. 
એકણે ગોડા રાખી લે ને પો વારે વે વે કે ઉઠણ વે કે ભાઈ લાગે દુખિયા ને પાણ <laughs> The Meghwars used to herd cattle. One day, the family borrowed money from a wealthy kiln owner to pay a hospital bill. They say it was their only option because like millions of others in Pakistan, they don't have a bank account or know how to read. So the Meghwars weren't even sure what the terms were. They still don't know. Joe's mother Vasanthi joined the family here 12 years ago to help erase their debt. Vasale majbur chokra chanda je vanyu oda zamindar ne vat ta ho bachavan aba bare mahina jo ko se kar to tuto pyo ai utte bas yairan The 70 year old says this work has worn down her knees and made it harder to walk. While her family keeps working, Vasanthi leaves for a while to make lunch. Inflation has made life harder lately. Donkeys help move up to 5,000 bricks from the plots to the kilns every day. The bricks are buried inside this oval-shaped structure where they'll bake. workers stack them so that hot air can flow in between mehsoos khana mein hath de te ungutha de te jaldi ho jana ye sir mein hath laga de to mano ye ungure se jaldi ho jana they cover the top with sand then they make holes and fill the gaps between the bricks with wood This part of the job is so dangerous workers didn't even want us coming near them. Nikal bar parte parte ghat mein ghat puchu to nahi gaya. The ground here is hot and the temperature inside the kilns can exceed 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Sometimes the tops of these structures cave in. In July 2022, three people were burned alive. when they drop down into the blazing kiln construction sites across the country use these bricks in everything from lining bridges and canals to building homes asa ke khabar hai wo wada wada amir khane da ko maale thaye ko bangla thaye ko school in thaye ko pakka pakka kamra da thaye sa jo ghar kacche mitri sa tha tha The bricks are durable and fireproof, but making them causes a lot of pollution. More than 20% of brick kiln workers in Pakistan have chronic breathing problems. These fumes are full of carbon monoxide and sulfur, which can harm the eyes, lungs, throat and skin. There are about 20,000 kilns like this one in Pakistan and 100,000 more scattered across South Asia. They account for over 91% of air pollution in some cities. As of November 2022, Pakistan's Environmental Protection Agency has closed nearly 70 kilns because of over pollution. 
Another big problem at these kilns is child labor. Zahid Thebo has worked with the Society for the Protection of the Rights of the Child, or SPARC, since 2006. His team visits brick kilns when the owners aren't around to check up on working conditions. Child labor is against the law in Pakistan. But estimates have found that about a third of workers at brick kilns are underage. And in some places, more than half aren't even 10 years old. The owner of the kiln where Dilip's at denied that any children work there. मेरे ख्याल में सबसे ज्यादा जो जुर्म इनका वो उनकी आजादी छीन लेना उनकी मूवमेंट छीन लेना अब तो मॉडर्न डे स्लेवरी है ये पहले की तरह अब जंजीरें लगा के बट्ठे पे कैद नहीं रखते What happens at brick kilns falls under the legal definition of debt bondage and it isn't just happening in Pakistan Reports suggest there are nearly 25 million people trapped in modern-day slavery across Asia and the Pacific regions alone. The only industry where it's more common than in brick production is farming. Pakistan's constitution made bonded labor illegal in 1992. The Department of Labor here in Sindh province told us it can't prove there's debt bondage at these kilns because there are no records that the families officially work there. But experts say kiln owners often have government ties, which makes it easier to escape enforcement. Birkelin Honor is a great association that is made in the country. They work as a mafia, like the whole country. The Brick Kiln Owners Association Zahid refers to didn't get back to us, but their website says they're committed to eliminating bonded labor and protecting workers' rights. Zahid says his NGO brings families' cases to court. We go to that house and take them to since it started in 1992, Spark has helped free over 17,000 workers. satisfaction The NGO moves the families to a camp called Azadnagar, which means free city. Most here still work at kilns, but they don't owe money. Karza nahi uthate, kheti kar kaam karte hain, jo mazuri hai, nahi lagata hai, set. Ab Allah tere ko khush rakhe, main dusre bate mein jala jaunga. Ye wajah hai, azadi hai. Pannu Fakir started making bricks when he was eight years old, after his family took out a loan. इतना जुल्म है, तो उजरत नहीं देते, दूसरा अंदर डाल के उसमें ऑफिस में उनको मारते हैं, या जूठी एफआर कट के उसको थाने में बंधवाते हैं, मेरे को पुलिस के ऊपर आज तक गुस्सा आता है। We reached out to the local police department, who denied any allegations of violence. A court order helped clear Pannu's family debt over two decades ago, and he's been living here ever since. Now he works with Zahid to free other workers. Assalamu alaikum, Pannu. Pannu travels with families to court if they get a date. But he says he faces threats from kiln owners 
and was even attacked during a workers' rights protest near the colony in 2013. He says it's a price worth paying to help others like him. But residents here don't have running water and there's no school. The NGO says it's requested aid from the government. Still, people living in Azadnagar feel lucky to have escaped the cycle of debt. And today, they're celebrating a wedding at the colony. Zahid is the guest of honor. Back at the kiln, Bunjo's wife Rani starts cooking dinner at sunset. She's kneading dough to make roti. With this debt looming over the family, their options are limited. Dilip also says he has little to look forward to except hanging out with his friend. For them, it's a treat to buy a bag of rice snacks once a week. Dilip says he doesn't think he'll ever have the chance to learn how to read. He's accepted his fate, but he hopes others don't take their education for granted. This mountain in Bolivia used to hold the most silver in the world. But over the last 500 years, miners have dug out nearly every last bit. Indigenous people were forced into this work by Spanish colonizers in the 1500s. Generations later, it's the only job they know. No tengo miedo, ya. Yo soy desde jovencito, desde mi juventud he trabajado. These days, the men mostly find zinc, tin, and lead. But the non-stop mining has left this 15,000-foot mountain porous and unstable. If you look at aerial photos of the mountain, you can see what looks like giant holes in the tip of the mountain just from cave-ins. The extinct volcano is infamously known as the mountain that eats men. It's no, no se puede aguantar, pero nosotros aguantamos. 
So why do so many people risk their lives inside a mountain on the brink of collapse? And why has so little changed for them since colonial times? At 13,000 feet, Potosi is one of the highest cities on the planet. Cerro Rico, or Rich Mountain, towers over it. It made Potosi the wealthiest place in Latin America back in the 16th century. Today, it's one of the poorest. Luciano lives at the base of the mountain with his wife in a one-room house. There's no heat, just electricity and a stove for cooking. Luciano is semi-retired. But to make ends meet, he still mines once or twice a week. About 40% of Potosi's residents work in mining-related jobs. And nearly half of the population lives in extreme poverty, more than three times the national average. After 10 minutes, the bus drops Luciano at the mine. He stocks up on alcohol, and he buys coca leaves that give him energy. Then he buys sticks of dynamite to use later. There are nearly 500 mines in here, but many are abandoned. After entering the mine, Luciano first makes an offering to El Tío or the uncle. Bueno, Tío Benito. Some historians believe the Spanish installed statues of the devil to scare the workers and instill discipline. Tantos años que estamos trabajando aquí adentro, con tu protección, no, no, aquí adentro no me hagas sufrir, que me vaya bien siempre. Las vetas también. Legend has it that in 1544, an indigenous farmer called Diego Walpa discovered silver here while looking for his lost llamas. But it's the Spaniards who excavated most of it when they conquered Potosi in the 16th century. European engravings show how they forced more than 13,000 local indigenous peoples and enslaved Africans to work at the mines. Over the next 200 years, more than 40,000 tons of silver were shipped to Europe. Across the Spanish Empire, silver bars and coins were used as currency, funding the army and churches. Hundreds of years later, Bolivia's state mining company Comibol took over Cerro Rico. And when the price of silver dropped drastically in the 1980s, Comibol handed the mountain over to the indigenous people of the region. Currently, about 16,000 miners work here. They're descendants of the same indigenous communities who toiled here centuries ago. 65 miles of tunnels connect the mountain. These rails were installed between the 16th and 19th centuries. And miners still use simple tools like a chisel and hammer to extract ore. Otros trabajan con ansos, otros no. Yo no, caso de eso, siempre será mis manitos, que será. Mis manos son, serán fuertes. 
Today, Luciano is chipping away at a vein of tin, which is black in color. Extra. Esto es. Esto ya me sirve a mí. But to find bigger pieces, he has to go deeper into the mountain's unexplored corners. For that, he needs dynamite. Si no hay esto, no, no, no recibimos ni, no, no podemos sacar ningún trozo de mineral de este peña. Entonces, esto voy a meter a, al agujero que está al huequito, ahí lo voy a taquear fuertecito. Entonces, ahí va a reventar, lo va a botar a este peña. Luciano has to act fast since he's competing with other miners. He moves nearly 200 feet away after setting off the dynamite. Workers collect the broken rocks into sacks that can weigh up to 90 pounds. An elevator pulls the minerals up to where the mining carts are. The fatality rate inside small-scale mines like these is 90% higher than in industrialized countries. Many miners contract silicosis, a deadly lung disease caused by constant exposure to dust, usually after 10 years of working inside the mine. Luciano was hospitalized for over a year because of it. De todo ya lo siento, no estoy ya en mi cabalidad como antes, ya no trabajo. Me tengo agitación hasta de mis vestas. Luciano is 52, but most workers don't live past the age of 40. Luckily, he gets health insurance because he's part of one of the many cooperatives that control the mines. Each co-op has anywhere from 50 to 1,000 members, and they're all indigenous. Miners pay mostly monthly dues and a one-time membership fee that can cost up to $1,000. Members can also hire contractors to work on their behalf. Sometimes these are other members of the mining cooperative, but sometimes they're day laborers. And the whole group works together following, for example, one vein of zinc or complejo, the mixed ore vein. The biggest benefit of cooperatives is that miners can keep whatever they find. They could make a ton of money, enough to put themselves or their kids through school. Your children will still inherit their membership in the cooperative, but instead of actually going underground and mining themselves, they only hire out day laborers to work on their behalf. But day laborers aren't a part of cooperatives and don't get any benefits, only a daily wage as little as 10 US dollars. Luciano can make about $70 on a good day, mining lead, zinc, or tin. These days, he rarely comes across silver. Most of it was exploited by 1825. But sometimes he can find traces of it in rocks. Ahí está la plata. Esto clarito está que decimos sí. All the minerals are dumped into pits off the side of the mountain. They're sorted and then sold to middlemen who are buyers for foreign companies. Trucks transported out of Bolivia, which is landlocked, to ports in neighboring Chile. Then the unrefined minerals are shipped overseas. 
In 2021, Bolivia sold nearly $1.3 billion worth of zinc. Its uses include cars, batteries, even paint and rubber. Most of it ends up in South Korea, where it's processed at factories. In addition to refining zinc, they're also able to extract indium, which is a mineral that is needed for a lot of touchscreen and um, high-end technologies that is much more lucrative, the unrefined zinc that the Bolivians export. The Bolivians do not receive any money for the indium that they export. It's often treated as a flaw. While mineral exports keep Bolivia afloat, decades of excavation have destabilized Cerro Rico. Now, it's slowly sinking because of mining at the very top. It's incredibly dangerous to be mining in the, the tip of the mountain because cave-ins are so increasingly common there. But it's also one of the places where there is the most remaining mineral, and so a lot of people are willing to take very high risks. In 2014, a presidential decree was passed to stop excavation above the 14,000-foot mark. But several cooperatives did not sign the agreement. Now some experts say Cerro Rico is like a piece of Swiss cheese with many holes in it. The cooperative miners aren't coordinating where they're going to go, what vein they're following. And so you can have a lot of structural problems that develop in the mountain when two miners are working quite close to one another, both following separate veins, but not leaving enough rock there to hold up the tunnel for anyone else who comes after. State mining company Comibol is in charge of keeping the mountain structurally safe, even though it doesn't own the mines. Para bolivianos es pues es un monumento. Desde hace años el Cerro Rico está pues en el escudo nacional. Gregorio Socanio Coro is a technician for Comibol. Today, he's overseeing a project funded by the Bolivian government to fortify parts of the mountain. They're pumping cement into the peak to stabilize the shaky rocks. Nosotros estamos haciendo lo que es relleno seco de emergencia para evitar los deslizamientos laterales para que no se engrande, engrande el diámetro de los hundimientos. Gregorio wants Cerro Rico to continue to be a source of pride for Bolivians. But today, it is an endangered World Heritage Site. And the livelihoods of thousands of locals are at stake. Bueno, los mineros en el interior del Cerro Rico trabajan casi los 24 horas. Es sostén económico para Potosí. Every so often, Luciano visits this local cemetery. Aquí está solo de, de una cooperativa todos los mineros que están, mis primos de, de mis pueblos, eh, los ex trabajadores. Mis... Today, he's paying his respects to his late cousin Zacharias. Eh, buen trabajador, buen. Historians estimate about 8 million miners have died here from illnesses or accidents since the 16th century. Some graves here are nearly 200 years old. While Luciano relies on El Tío for support in the mines, here he prays to Jesus. Tanto en adentro, tanto aquí en afuera, protéjanos. Yo soy un pobre humilde. Meanwhile, Cerro Rico continues to loom over the city. 
a source of pride, fear, and sorrow for Bolivians. This road in the Himalayas is one of the most dangerous in the world. But Sartaj risks his life here every day, all to build the longest tunnel in Asia at 12,000 feet above sea level. India is spending nearly a billion dollars on it. Thousands of workers have moved here and spend hours breaking rocks that are over 45 million years old. But there's a political motive behind the tunnel. It would allow India to send more troops to its contested northern border with China, where clashes have become frequent over the years. These are two global heavyweights, and the fact that they are not able to agree on this very long, tense border, this is nothing to sneeze at. So will the Zojila Tunnel be a game changer in the rivalry between India and China? And how is building it in this isolated part of the world even possible? Every day, this kitchen prepares breakfast for hundreds of workers before they head to the tunnel. Today, they're fueling up on samosas and chickpeas. Sartaj Ahmed Ghanai is a plumber on the project. He's one of 750 people, all men, who have been living at this nearby camp for months. <laughs> The tunnel will cut down travel time between Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh from three hours to just 20 minutes. The existing road is closed for six months because of heavy snow. Last year, avalanches forced workers to temporarily stop construction. Oxygen is scarce at this altitude. But the tunnel is ventilated with this tube that pumps in fresh air. Water is constantly seeping in from glaciers melting nearby. So far, only half of the tunnel has been built, about four miles. And people are working around the clock. Engineers are reinforcing it with steel bars, while electricians are adding wiring in the walls. Today, Sartaj is fixing a broken pipe that supplies water into the tunnel to cool down heavy machinery. The men are working from both ends till they meet in the middle. They go about 10 feet deeper every day by blasting the mountain walls with dynamite. Everyone leaves the tunnel before the explosion. Distance comes from 4, 500, 500, 600 meters. Insider was not allowed to film the blast because it's too dangerous. There's a doctor on standby to provide first aid, but the nearest hospital is 60 miles away. After the explosion, workers load up trucks with debris and dump them outside. Some of these rocks will be crushed and reused later to build the walls inside. Mountain tunnels like Zojila have a long history. In 1871, France and Italy built the Mont Cenis Tunnel, which took over a decade to complete. The tunnel runs through the Alps 
and is roughly the same length as the Zojila Tunnel. But back then, nothing of the scale had ever been built before. The engineer, Germain Samolier, introduced tunneling techniques and equipment that are still used today, like heavy rock drills and dynamite, which had just been invented. And Zojila is also expected to be a game changer. It'll be eight miles long when it's completed in 2026, making it the longest two-lane road tunnel in Asia. But most importantly, it will give India greater access to its 2,100-mile-long border with China. What makes it even more complicated is that um, both countries have different views on where exactly the border is, uh, is disputed. It's never been formally demarcated. That's triggered several clashes, including three years ago, when 20 Indians and four Chinese soldiers died. You're looking at two nuclear-powered rivals that happen to be two of the most populous countries in the world hunker down and in dispute over a frontier. So I think that this has implications, not just for the region, but for the world on the whole. Both sides have sent tens of thousands of troops to the border area and are racing to build infrastructure. You know, I think that the broader goal there for India is simply to strengthen its, its, its position, not just its military position, but its economic position. I'm talking about the Himalayan region, which happens to be you know, a relatively water-rich region in an area that's experiencing significant levels of water scarcity. So there's a lot of strategic value to this territory as well. That's why Muhammad Altaf feels like he's doing a service to his nation by being here. Altaf is the head chef, and his kitchen feeds all these workers, come rain or shine. Altaf says he really misses his two young children. But the cooking keeps him busy. Sartaj is also part of the brotherhood they've created. He spends about 12 hours at this remote construction site every day. But his family is what keeps him going. And since he's the main breadwinner, he's doing all he can to support them. Sartaj 